Okay, guys and girls, ladies and gents, uh, welcome to Friday. And I don't know where you are in the whole um, sort of uh, end of year thing. For me, this is my last Friday before a well-end break. I hope you have you know, had a similarly good week and I hope you're bringing everything to a close uh, nicely. In a second, I'm going to ask you, um, Sophie, welcome. Excuse me. <clears throat> in a second, I'm going to ask you what was your main reason for coming today? In other words, I want to understand a little bit about uh, what you were drawn to uh, in, in Martin's story, alternatively, what you want to know. But I want to give you a bit of background as to why I love these particular type of masterclasses. I love all the type of opportunities I have to sit down through the podcast and the webinar to sort of talk to uh, people with interesting stories or expertise. But this is one kind of story that I really love. Uh, in 2015, I wrote a book called Finnovation. And at the time, uh, I'd just been through this experience of being a managing partner of a, of a tech-based startup incubator called Corporate to Freedom, where I had the opportunity to kind of have a live uh, as an investor, but I also learned a lot about the way that they, they do business uh, in the tech world and how it differs from traditional business models. And uh, what I started to do is I started to coach some of my, my, the practices I was working with as a coach and consultant, and I started to notice that there was this synergy between some of these methodologies that tech startups use and 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 sort of some of the traditional ways that that, that we've approached practice management or best practice. In other words, there was kind of a, a bit of innovation in this gap between the two areas. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Um, and at the time when I wrote the book, one of the things I noticed or wrote about at the beginning is how despite all of these issues in the industry and these inefficiencies and, and a general feeling amongst a lot of advisors that the technology we had, even back then, wasn't quite serving the needs as well as it should. There wasn't that many practices out there who had, would, were going and solving the problems. And the, one of the rules in, in the tech startup space is if you can get really close to the customer where you understand the problem, you understand the need, you understand the challenges, it helps you to craft a solution that really hits those problems as opposed to traditional product development, which relies on focus groups and uh, you know, inventing things out of, out of the blue. Now, that was back in 2015. But what's happened over the last uh, seven years is there's been an explosion of advice businesses who have essentially gone, you know what? There's no solution out there. I think the way that I'm doing it in an analog kind of way is is a great, and I want to be able to make it scalable. So they go and build their own technology. And that's exactly what Martin's done. He's one of those, those advisors who has essentially scratched his own itch. And today we're going to talk about the journey from you know, being a practice owner, so essentially having a software platform, not to mention coaching practices himself on how to implement it in their business. Um, in terms of meeting Martin, I actually got to know more about Martin before we actually met because uh, a good friend of mine, Helen Ashley, we shared an office for a while. She's a, a, a wonderful artist. And she knocked on my door uh, one one Friday and, and, and said, look, I know you work with advice practices. Can I, my, my husband, Simon, and I are going to see an advisor. Can I give you this terms of engagement and you can have a look at it and, and, and see whether or not it's uh, above board? And I looked at it and I read through it and I just came to the realization that it was talking about all the right things. It was talking about outcomes. It was talking about goals and objectives. It was laying out the advice process in simple terms. And I sort of said to her, I, this, this practice knows what they're doing. They seem to approach it. And uh, I'll never forget when she went and met with um, the representative from the practice and came back. I said, what was it like? And she said, it was amazing. We barely talked about money. Uh, and that was my first experience of Martin's practice, my financial mentors. Uh, about, I think it was about a year later, uh, we ended up having a conversation. We ended up doing some work together. And I guess since then, I've not only had the opportunity to work with Martin in a business sense, but I've got to know him as, as an entrepreneur, as someone who looks to innovate, as someone who uh, has been through a lot of different coaching experiences. And, and I'm, I've come to regard him as, as not only a friend, but someone I, I, I like to uh, bounce ideas off. And, and I think he's added enormous amount of value to me as a coach as well. Um, so I'm really keen to have this conversation and, and give you a bit of insight into Martin's journey from being that advisor through to someone who's done all of these things and, and also the challenges along the way. Before we do, let's just get, let's get warmed up. So do me a favor. If you can open the chat box, Andrew, Brian, Chris, Rodney, Sandip, welcome. Nice to meet you. Sophie and Trevor. Can you let me know? Uh, just first, Kevin the rank. Where are you today? Uh, are you sat in your office? Are you uh, at home? Are you on the beach? I'd love to get a picture of where you're at and your surroundings. Okay, Andrew's in the office. I can get the image of where you are because I've, I've seen that background a number of different times. No doubt you're probably wearing those headphones. Uh, Rodney's at home. Chris is in the car. Okay, beautiful, Chris. Sandep's at home. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Cool. Uh, Trevor, you're at home. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a bit of a mix. People all over the shop. 
again, I would love to know, what's the main thing that drew you here today? What is it about, about sort of Martin's story or about the blurb or about the, you know, the, the webinar topic that made you go, you know what? And Chris, you may not be able to answer this because you're in the car, um, but that made you go, you know, I'm going to invest my time and I'm going to go along and hear a little bit about, uh, you know, what was written about. What Andrew's curious. That's a good answer. Curiosity. I don't know. Does curiosity kill cats? I've never seen a cat killed by curiosity, but I don't own a lot of cats. So Andrew said curiosity. That's a good answer. What else? Uh, Chris, I'd imagine you guys know each other. I, I understand for quite a while, so that might have some part of it. I always like to go to um, uh, interviews with people I already know and listen to because I find out stuff I didn't know. Uh, Chris wants to know about the progress of Martin Software. Beautiful. Okay, well, we're absolutely going to talk about that because it's it's come on uh, it's come on a lot since I've seen it. It's now in a situation where I, yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. What else? Sophie, there must be a reason you've joined us today. Trevor would love to know. Uh, Rodney's seen part of the journey and he's very supportive. Cool. All right. We'll keep it coming, guys. Um, I always like these things to be a bit more of an interactive. I think some of the questions you've got to ask are probably some of the better ones that I want to put out there. But let's get this underway. And without further moments delay, Martin, are you there, sir? Let's get you up and live. Uh, uh, here. How are you? Good. Are you sick, mate? I am. I'm. I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, the penultimate Friday before Christmas, which is not not anywhere as near as elegant as the night before Christmas. But um, have you had it? I I think we were chatting before, and you your Christmas has ended up becoming quite packed that final week, hasn't it? So I've got a a week. Um, I'm cramming. I'm cramming two weeks into one week because I'm just coming off uh, a week of COVID, which has been fun, and I've uh, got quite a week ahead of me. Wow. Is this your first um, experience with the, the COVID or have you had it before? No, second time around. Uh, and was it, was, it, was it better second time around or just as nasty? Uh, stunning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's just dive into it because, um, uh, by the way, if you listen to this later on the podcast, do stick around until the end because uh, Martin's going to talk a little bit about uh, something he wants to put out there and for those who are interested in, in finding out more. But um, for those who don't know you, Martin, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your business, uh, who you work with, and generally how 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 it all works. So a quick a quick background. I got into the industry in 1994, so it's been a couple of years since I started. <laughs> um, moved to Australia in 2010. So prior to that, we ran a fairly large business in South Africa, employed 24 people, um, had a couple of billion under management. Um, and a lot of clients came to Sydney, started again, uh, run a relatively small business, but uh, but a, a reasonably profitable, reasonably good business. And what kind of clients do you work with? So two primary areas of clients. So the one is uh, retirees and the other is yep. medical professionals. In my previous business in South Africa, it was built almost exclusively on medical professionals. And here, um, a lot of retirees and a lot of medical professionals, and then we've we've got we've got some other clients, but but those are the two real core areas. And was that something that you like going down the route of focusing on a specific market? Is that something you've always done, or or is it something you've just kind of gone? I want to do it that way because it's easier or it suits me better. So I landed on medical professionals in South Africa because I got lucky right at the beginning. Um, I got a couple of radiology and cardiology clients and uh, just networked from there. And it sort of grew from, from that and I sort of ended up specializing. I came to Australia and I thought I would do the same. Yeah. But it, it wasn't so simple going, establishing myself again, having no sort of presence or credibility in, in the market over here, I sort of took whatever clients I could get um, and we've just grown from there. And a lot of them happened to be started off with a lot of South Africans that had immigrated, that had sort of were in retirement space. Yep. Slowly but surely it's growing. It's growing to, to the other sectors as well. And I talked a little bit about my first, uh, you know, third party or hands, 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 arms distance experience with your business. But I mean, if you were to describe the way you provide advice, which has obviously influenced a lot of the software, how would you describe it? It's not about a product. Um, I think the way you open up with the 
conversation that we we had with those friends of yours, um, what I've realized is that our industry has really, really been focused on delivering product. And we've yep. forgotten over time that at the end of a product, there's a client and a client doesn't really care what pull they're taking. They just care about fixing the, the pain that they've got or, or fixing the opportunity that they want to go to. And mm. once we understand that and the client feels that they've been heard and understood, um, you're onto a good path. And that's what we've tried to do is create that, that business where you listen to the client, you understand what a client wants, then the, the solution could or could not be a product. So let's let's take it right back. So 1994, you started in advice. Did you always want to be in advice or, or did you get there sort of in a roundabout kind of way? So the last thing I wanted to do was be in advice. The very, very last thing I wanted to do was being in, being in advice. I was, at the time I was playing professional squash, um, trying to make a living, hitting a ball up and down a wall for five or six hours a day. <laughs> I was probably hitting the ball reasonably well, but I just wasn't making a living very well. Right. So I wanted to sort of supplement my income and somebody suggested go and do something where your time is your own. And I happened to see an advert um, and the person interviewing for the advert was a was an ex-Springbuck rugby player. And I thought, He's, he speaks sport, I speak sport, maybe there's a conversation <laughs> to be had. I went to see him not knowing it was insurance and I got in there and I said to him, you know, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I didn't realize it was <laughs> insurance. And he said, so why did you come? And I said, well, because you, you're a sportsman. I'm a sportsman. I thought maybe the interview would go well. So he said, well, let's talk about sports. And that's what we did. For an hour, we spoke about sport. And then he said, come back and let's have, let me just tell you a bit more about what we do. And I came back and I ended up, uh, taking a job there and I haven't left since then. Well, I mean, I guess that's the ultimate, like particularly if you're talking about um, 994 insurance sales. Now, the ability to hold a conversation with someone you just met would have been a pretty big, um, a good skill to have. So in, in many ways, it's, it makes a lot of sense. So in, you moved out here in 2010. So you, you've been in the industry for 16 years over in South Africa. And you'd ob had, obviously the role, it sounds like it evolved quite a bit from you know insurance sales to, to something that was very much advice. When you came out here, knowing what you knew um, from South Africa, did you have a really clear blueprint around the kind of business you want to build and the kind of advice you wanted to give? Or did it kind of evolve from 2010 onwards? Yeah, so I would say 2010 in many respects, while it was hard to immigrate and immigration is hard, probably the luckiest year I've ever had because I had some partners in South Africa that were exceptionally good entrepreneurs and exceptionally good partners. And they wouldn't actually let me buy a business or get involved in a business. They said that I had to spend a year thinking and studying and putting together everything in my mind that had worked really well for us. Historically, mm. and everything that hadn't worked well and and then putting in a template to repeat the things that were working well and, and stop doing the things that weren't working. Okay. And it was, it was the first time that I'd actually had the luxury of being able to think. And I sat down and I just built what I think a good business would look like moving forward with where I thought legislation, regulation may go and where I thought consumerism may go. What would a business look like? Okay. And and that's that was just a lucky year. And when you look back on, um, you know what, I've just done a session with the program about um, prioritizing your time or planning your calendar. And one of the criteria we talk about is priority time, which is, um, you know, the the reality is that not enough time is necessarily spent just working out what work you want to do. It's like the Bunnings thing. But you know, I've you know I've done so many times in my life I've I've gone right. I'm gonna, do a project i go to bunnings i look up the aisle and i take a bunch of stuff home and, ah, it's not going to work so i go back to bunnings and you do that five or six times until you realize sitting down and working out all the, the ideas that are not going to work before you do anything kind of works well so when you look back at that blueprint how much of it did you just follow to the t in other words you were right from 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 day one and how much of it were you proven slightly wrong or very wrong so you never write from day one 
Like you're never right. Doesn't matter what you do, you're never right from day one. Yep. But you you're a lot closer to being right when you think through it, and and you know that you're going to have to have iterations. So um, even even today with the software journey, I realise that I'm I'm not right from day one. Very seldom, and and I'm quite lucky that I I think I mentioned to you I'm I'm, I'm working very closely with um, with somebody that uh, that actually specialises in um, in well being, entrepreneurial well being. And he's he's been guiding me and just saying to me it's it's okay to get started and make mistakes and the market will tell you if you're right as opposed to you knowing or thinking that you're right um, and just having that permission to know that you're likely to be wrong but you've got to keep reiterating <laughs> is quite empowering um, and also what has happened is I have historically I've been I've sort of just got an idea and chased that idea and put everything into it. Now I'm starting to think a little bit clearer and saying, is this an idea that would fix my business or would it fix a bigger, a bigger solution? Uh, this, is always, this is always one of the challenges when you have uh, advisors who build their own tech and then put it to market. It's that there's always this, sometimes in many cases, they put something out to work for them because their business is built a certain way and there's certain philosophies. That And 90% of the time, that's not going to work for other people. And that's the challenge. You've got to come up with something that sort of is going to be relevant to other people, not just sort of your idea. I, I, I want to take it back because obviously you, you're building this business. Um, you've had this year of thinking. You start to focus on a certain market and it expands. But but a big part of what I know about you is is this kind of started by, as a lot of stories do, but you start to develop your own intellectual property, right? And and, and starting to kind of um, industrialize, I guess you'd say. Um, was that something that just happened? Or were there influences that led you to sit down and go, right, I've got to create these frameworks, or these models, or these ways of of working? Like, how did, how did that happen? Because most businesses don't necessarily think to sit down and go, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, systemize this kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, so and in, in the early days, None of it was systemized. I right. always had ideas. I always, I've always been reasonably creative in, in thinking differently and trying to do things differently. But I hadn't created a framework for, for doing something constructive with the RP. So I'd create tools and templates. I would use them in my business for a while. I would stop using them and sort of use the next shiny toy Um but only over time did I realize the value of process, the value of um, uh, of having systems. And uh, ironically, while regulation has been a, a, a frustrating issue for all of us in the advice industry, um, it's also been an incredibly good one for me because right. it's pushed process into my life. And uh, when, when process has come in, you have the ability to use your – your creativeness in in other areas. So, can you talk a bit about why? You, so, you, you mentioned that that point about you think that legislation has required you to systematize. Can you expand on that a bit more? Like, what about the legislation and and how? Well, I think legislation wants consistency. So, it wants it wants a good process that's fair to the consumer consistently. Um, and without uh, without a process, consistency is going to be a, a challenge. Right. Um, when my parent my parents moved to Australia six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I always laugh about, my mom brought one of my nursery school reports. So I must have been four or five years old at the time, and the teacher had written something that says Martin has a huge desire to solve the world's oil problems. <laughs> He just Oil has no, no desire to put his blocks back in the right drawers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think back that relatively little has changed over the last 50 years. Um, so I've got to put process around me to make sure that I do put the blocks back in the right drawers. I love it. I love it. See, I'm, I'm, Virginia, I'm very, very organized, but um, uh, it took a while to get there myself. Um, so, like, there's one, there's one thing to be developing IP and developing, you know, your tools and templates and frameworks and maybe worksheets and and maybe even PowerPoint presentations. It's a very different thing to suddenly sit down and go, you know what, I'm going to turn this into a technology tool. How did that come about? Like, what was the moment that you went, yeah, I'm going to build some tech? So, 
if one thing has frustrated me in this industry, it is the tech that's available to us. Um, so there, there's incredibly good pieces of technology. There's, there's the X plans of the world, which if we objective is, is a really good piece of technology. I mean, it's, it's taken a lot of thinking. It does a lot of things, but it's been built in, in my opinion, it's been built in little silos that talk to one particular thing that don't put the whole journey together, that don't put the whole thought process together. And it's, I liken it to an IKEA store. You go into IKEA, you can buy whatever you want. You've just got to then go and build it. And I've just thought that the client experience has been forgotten. So yep. software has been built around regulation or it's been built around selling a product or it's been built around systemizing an advisor's practice. Nothing has really been built around the client having a great experience with the advisor because if we if we bring it down to the simplest form, if a client has a great experience working with an advisor, then the advisor's got a good business. That is sustainable. That is a model that's going to last for forever. And then the rest of the things can happen in the background to make the efficiencies happen, to make the products um, fit in with the, those efficiencies. So I've needed to build my own tools in right. Excel normally. Um, and I've loved Excel because I've got more competent at it over the years. Um, but it's not scalable. And Excel is fantastic for me. Yeah. And I've just thought, well, if I want to roll this out and I want other financial advisors to benefit from it, I've got to do something different. And that's where the journey began. It's interesting. A lot of people forget that, that Excel is a programming language. It's a really simple, it can be quite effective. It's got limitations, but as you said, it, it, it's, it's great because you can build anything, but there comes a point where you'll hit a ceiling and it just, it breaks. It's very hard to stop. Um, to make uh, Excel or, or even Google Sheets, that matter, sort of industrial. So, what was the first version like? Was it just um, was it just an Excel sheet, or was there was there more to it? So, the very first version was a simple, simple Excel sheet. Okay. It then became a more complex Excel sheet, and then it became yep. two Excel sheets, and then five Excel sheets, and then I wanted the five Excel sheets to all talk to each other because I didn't want to capture the same information five or six times. Right. Um, and then the problem is that you create a million macros and you have printing and one mistake in one sheet leads to a 10 minute delay in sheet number five. Um, uh, so it became really, really challenging. I've, I've, I, I had, not so much anymore, but it, it wasn't that long ago. You, you, I'd get advisors talking to me, particularly at conferences, and go, look, I built this great Excel spreadsheet. And you'd have a look at it, and you'd kind of look at it, and you go, that's great, but either somebody's already done it as a, as a software tool, or you could do that much more simply. You know what I mean? Um, what was the point at which you realized that this wasn't just you know, a tool that you were going to use in your own business and kind of was just supplementing things, and that you wanted to to turn it into something that was a bit more industrial. Was there was there a moment where you went, I've, I've, got to, I've, got to, I've got to make this into a grown-up version? I guess there were two, there were two realities that, that came to my mind. The one is, in again, coming from a planning business in South Africa, I always had this view of growing something that was really material that I could scale the business. And one day when I retired, I could sell the business at some meaningful amount. So the first realization was, I think the days of building a really big, scalable financial planning business have to some extent come and gone. It's not a race to the top in terms of growing the assets, charging on the assets and building margin at every level of the, of the product scale. Those, those days I don't think exist anymore. So I wanted to build something, something scalable and then Six or seven years ago, I got invited to go back and do a series of workshops in South Africa for financial planners. Right. Just about my old business in South Africa relative to my new business over here and, and what the journey looked like. And as I was there, I was showing people how I ran my practice and what I was doing with the spreadsheets and what I was doing with the forms. And then everybody wanted these sheets and everybody wanted these forms. And I was giving a whole bunch of this stuff to people. And then I started realizing, well, maybe that's where the opportunity lies. Maybe the scale 
is empowering advisors to to deliver things in a better experience, in a better way, way and and better, and and those are the two catalysts. It's interesting because that um, is one of, one of the things that I've really loved about and I've taken from my experience in in, in the tech startup space is this is like building something quickly and cheaply, putting it in front of a customer and seeing if they like it. If they don't like it, find out why. Find out if they're solvable. If they do like it, then kind of go further down that route. And compared to what a lot of advisors do, a lot of businesses do is they 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 sit there in the back office or in the you know in the dark trying to work on this thing that they they're trying to perfect it, trying to perfect it, trying to perfect it, and then eventually they perfect it, they get it out there, they spend a bunch of money on it, and it just doesn't it doesn't fly because it's not had that that iteration process. So it's interesting. I don't know whether you you intended to go down that route or it just it happened that way, but that was really really smart. No. Um, so when when you decided to turn it into a software tool, I mean, like there must be a lot of practices out there who go, I've, "I'd like to do that," but they didn't know how to bridge that gap between. I mean, do you, did you go and find a coder? How did you finance it? How did you know what kind of coder to find? How did you know what you were going to build it in? You know, all of these. How do I do that? Questions. How did you how did you approach them? COVID was really good to me. Um, <laughs> First time around. Well, not first time I got COVID, but first first lockdown. Okay. So stuck at home, thinking, wanting to create stuff, wanting to do something more material. So I got onto um, Upwork, what was the platform, yep. and I looked for people that could take my Excel sheets and develop them further, make them cleaner, make them better. And uh, I happened to find a young uh, developer in India um, a lady that helped me fix a problem that I had in Excel and she fixed it really, really quickly for me. And then she helped me with four or five sheets after that. And then I needed a, a fifth sheet done. And she said to me, she's struggling with time. Would I mind working with her husband? So I said, I, I don't really want to change. I'm happy with you. So she said, look, he's, yeah. he's really good at what he does. So I started working with the husband. And it was fantastic. And I had developed a really good relationship with them. I've been working with them for a few months. Eventually, I put an offer on the table and suggested to him that he comes and he works full time for me. He leaves his right. job. And initially, he wasn't brave enough. He didn't know me. He wasn't scared. And then he was too scared. And then he decided he would <laughs> have a go at it about five months after asking him. And he joined me, and, and as we were developing one of the sheets, he said to me, look, why don't we just build an application from this? It's better than keep doing the Excel. Mm. It, you know, can you do this? So he said, of course I can do that. That's what, that's what I'm good at. Excel is what, I, what I'm learning. So he started developing this for me, and now we've developed a couple of – we found a couple of people that, that help him and work for him, and right. it's just – Taken us, uh, taken us down this journey, and uh, really, really excited about what they've done. Exactly the way I got the fee model at all developed back in the day, and I think I always felt a lot of the 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 luck. I guess the draw is finding somebody who can not just do what you need them to do, but also kind of has a vision they can turn around and go, "Why don't you do this? That could be better." In other words, same deal. I started fee model. started life as a as a as a, uh, a spreadsheet. And then eventually I was dealing with somebody who said, why don't you put a database on the back of it? And then it just built from there. But finding that, I found finding that person was the, I guess, the luck of the draw. And since then I've had situations where, you know, I've found developers and they've just been awful versus they, every now and again, you find, you know, maybe 40% of the time you find somebody who really knows their stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. You don't get it right first time. I mean, I no. didn't get it right first time. Uh, and I got it. And I've still got it wrong. I've found other developers to help me with different pieces, and I don't get it right. How much did that first build cost? Can if, if you, can you can I ask? I don't even. I'm always embarrassed to tell you because <laughs> we've spent so much time and so much money on going down routes that haven't worked. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've spent we we we've easily spent a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars on okay. on development. So but I mean that that initial version, that version one that you got out, which was just converting it to a spread from a spreadsheet, was that was that expensive or was that relatively cost effective? So I don't know what expensive is, but um, but probably sixty or seventy thousand dollars. And and what I will tell you about that, wow, it looks 
fantastic. It, it does. Love that piece. I absolutely love that piece of software. And we've put it on us. It's sitting in my freezer waiting to come out one day. And we're not <laughs> working any further on that right now because what we've got right now is what I feel that the market is ready for and the market needs. And um, and I'm going to be patient and say one one day we'll get to that. Funny, the next question I was going to ask you is about whether there was any functionality that you originally, I, I want a tool that's going to do this and it's going to do this, that just didn't make the final cut. But it sounds like there's a whole bunch of them in your freezer um, that just never made um, you know, never made the light of day. Is that, is that, am I right on that? I wish I could say no. <laughs> so, but you, but you're you're a hundred percent right. So, so we have built what I feel is um, if if you ignore the the concept of a statement of advice for for now, but you mm. think about a, a fact find, you think about a consultation, um, all the calculators that may be required. We have built all of that. It's sitting there in my freezer, waiting to waiting to come out. <laughs> So what what was the stuff that you thought was going to be really really important? Like in your head, when you were building it, you get oh I'm going to build this because everybody's going to want it, and and it just in the end it either just didn't land or it wasn't it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. In other words, where where were you proven wrong? Okay, so the so the best example I can have with that is the concept of a risk profiling tool. Yeah, if you think that there's a on the one hand there's a behavioural risk profiling tool, which is what we've become accustomed to using in the industry. And then on the other extreme, there's pure rational finance where if somebody's got a goal that they need money in six months' time, we all know that they shouldn't be invested in equity markets. A behavior approach might say, well, if the client's really, really uh, risk tolerant, let's put him into equities because he's saying that he can. Conversely, if you only need the money in 20 years' time, um, you shouldn't be in cash even if you're conservative. So I thought, let, let me build a tool that can bridge those two worlds. Mm. It can show you what your tolerance is versus what your exposure should be based on your goal and show the client the differences. So I built a really sophisticated tool. We had great feeds from Morningstar, from s and We had gone on an incredible journey over here. And I had successfully converted a 20-minute consultation into a two-hour consultation that nobody was interested in. <laughs> oh, I love it. And, I can um, I better mousetrap it. It was a really, really good lesson on, um, on, on understanding what the market wants and what the market needs versus where I think they should go. I feel like sometimes you need to, from a creative perspective, you need to go down those blind alleys sometimes because I think if you build something, you go, it's a beautiful solution with absolutely no practical usage other than you kind of learn a lot about reality and idealism. And, and having worked with you a lot, I know you're very driven and you, you, you're, you're sort of very goals orientated. And sometimes being shown that maybe the thing that you think you're going to build isn't the thing you should build or you're overcomplicated. I think it's an, it's an important lesson along the way. Yeah. Um, tell me about the coaching because that that's become a big part of it, right? And I, I think you mentioned um, when you were going over and presenting the tool in South Africa in particular, um, what became apparent to you is that this wasn't – you could give people a tool, but they there was kind of a, a skill set they had to learn or, or a shift in the mindset they had to adopt in order to get there. But start, start off – I mean, you've, you've been a big investor in coaching yourself down the years. How did that come about? Started with, with squash. Um, I had some really, really good squash coaches as I was coming through. Um, some of them, one in particular, lives in Perth right now. Um, he's a guy in his mid-70s, and I still I still talk to him about lessons that he taught me 30-something years ago. Um, that gentleman? Uh, hold on one second. Uh, is it Mike Simmons? That's that's the one. Yeah, the you one. gave me a copy of it, and the intro is is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. It's a, such a great overview of coaching. So, so again, you look at that book, and I said to him, Mark, you've got a bestseller there if you just cut out everything that's that's related <laughs> to squash. 
if you just take the the intro of that book and sell that as a book, you've got an incredible story. Yeah, it's true. So, so I learned a fortune from from Mark. I, I spent a lot of time years later on the Strategic Coach Program in Toronto. Um, there's a guy, um, there's a guy in Sydney, um, Stuart Bell, who's had quite a big influence over the last couple of years on on my thinking and and what I do. So I've always learned from coaches. Um, and one of the biggest lessons is um, the a great lesson without any implementation is useless. Yeah. And what I've found is the best software in the world or the, the best ideas in the world, if they're not implemented, are, are just useless. So, so where I have found the ability to go and help advisors is mm. the fact that I've done this. You know what? What I'm implementing in my practice is is what I'm talking about. So, so I know what works. I know what doesn't work. I know the I know the pain points. I know where where it's difficult because I've experienced them. I still experience them every single day. I I was, I was the same. I, I made a decision relatively early on that I didn't want to be one of those consultants who jumps like i think they call them seagull consultants they kind of land poo on everything and then fly off in other words consultants are coming and go you should do this and you should do this and you need this and then when you know small business owners invariably go well how do i do it they go oh, i'll go and I'll, I'll be back later right? i want i want to be someone who comes here's how you do it here's the here's the methodology here's the tools and templates and i think because i agree with you i think it's derek sivers who came out with the line on the tim ferris podcast information alone is not the answer because if it was we'd all be billionaires with great abs driving lamborghinis but for you, that did you did you find the experience of going out and presenting the tool because it would have been early stage at that point, right? Pretty early stage, uh, and realizing that there were a bunch of people in the room who were drawn to the methodology but didn't necessarily understand the how. How did that change your perception of of your where you'd got to and your own skill set? Did it make you realize that maybe you you'd more you were more progressed than you thought you were, or did you already know that you were very good at it? No, I didn't know I was good at it. I really didn't. In fact, when, when I started talking to advisors, I didn't have a tool to talk to. Um, how it started, one of the fund managers in Australia asked me if I would just come and do a Q&A for a bunch of advisors that had come from South Africa, just in terms of what my old practice looked like and what my new practice looks like, what I've learned, what are the changes, what are the differences. Yeah. Um, and from that, it took... A life. I started getting phone calls from South Africa, um, from advisor practices or or from dealer groups saying, would I mind coming back and just giving them some more insight in terms of the mm. changes? Um, and only then, when I started showing people what I'm doing, did I realize that there's a, there was a big gap in what I was doing compared to what other practices were doing. Um, so I... I started sharing that and and started developing the technology around the gap. As soon as you got it out there, you realize where you where you're different or where you're bigger or better. Um, it's funny you made a point earlier about um, there's so many tools out there and we've got a lot of functionality. And I always think that one of the problems in our industry, in particular, people have built built all these software tools that can supposedly do it all, but they don't actually ever teach businesses or advisors how to implement it in a business model. And I kind of think it's like it's like someone comes in and gives you the best kitchen in the world with you know Thermomix and this that and it's all the greatest equipment, and then you realise you don't actually know how to cook. That that kind of tool is useless unless you know you know what it's used for. So let's talk about and and that's true of portals as well. I mean, there's been a lot of portal solutions down down the down the years, and they all hit the same problem, which is they've got all this great functionality. And I'm not going to name names, but advisors get them and they're like they've got these ideas about how they're going to implement them and six to nine or 12 months later they realize nobody's using it they're not using it the clients aren't using it because they don't really know how to make the business model work and i let's talk a bit about what you've built and in terms of where it is engagement hub yep. tell us about where it's at right now uh the technology what it does and 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 and, and what it what it's focused on so i'll try and for the purpose of this i'll try and keep it reasonably short and simple because okay. it does a lot of things. So the first instance, it's an engagement platform. It's it's an area that's there to create better engagement between a client and, and their advisor. Okay. How does the advisor simplify an 80-page financial advice document that they don't want to put together in, as an advisor and the client certainly doesn't want to read? 
How do you develop a one-page financial plan? How do you articulate to a client on an annual basis the value that you've added that he doesn't see? It's not the it's not the three or four hours that the client has, has spent with you. It's the 10 hours that you've done that they haven't seen that you've done. It's the 30 hours of of studying and work that you've you've learned that has gone into impacting their their outcomes. Right. We've created a whole bunch of engagement tools which we've uh, given to financial planners to use, and then we've created the portal that allows the advisor to share this with the client. Um, things like a financial services guide. How do you how do you make that accessible in an easy way. We, we're living in a world where cybersecurity is becoming a bigger and bigger issue all the time. 100%. Um, how do you build a secure way of giving information to, to clients um, with the clients actually wanting to go there and pick it up? Um, and that really is the, is the thing. And then, and then the, the, again, it's all about simplicity. How do you... How do you do it in a way that's dead simple for you as an advisor and for the client as a as a client? Um, what, where do you stand on the data, the, the usage of data? Do, do the clients sort of upload their data? I think they do from memory. So the ability is there for a for a client to upload their data into yep. for you. Um, or when you ask me where do I stand in that, are you talking about from a security perspective? Or are you talking about the? Uh, well, it's interesting because the cyber things. Uh, on the on the uh, on the agenda right now, particularly, I mean, I think it, it's been around for a while, but I think when the Optus thing kicked off, everybody went ah, went nuts, and then Medicare was next. But if you, if you look at data sets that businesses have, like Optus, they lost passports and driver's licenses, which is not great. Medicare lost a bit more than that, plus records of who had what illness, which is not good. Advice businesses must have one of the largest data sets about individual clients on the planet. Like the amount of data that we as businesses have to maintain, it started back with the anti-money laundering where the government went, oh, we'll just get advisors to do it. And it's just snowballed. So the fact that, you know, if, if, if put it this way, you mentioned there's, not, there's no such thing as massive scaled advice businesses. If there were and one of them got hacked and there's a 2,000 or 100,000 clients out there with the data on the web, I mean, it would be almost impossible for someone to protect their identity. Would you agree? Big problem, absolutely big problem. I mean, you you have everything: tax file numbers, the bank account yep. details, the health information. Um, so you've got to be as secure as, as as humanly possible, and I say as secure as humanly possible because clearly places like Medibank and Optus and um, the government associations take take measures. Um, so we've we've done the same. We've encrypted our uh, all the data. We use AWS. Um, that's where the data resides. Um, we have been as careful as as we can, and, and we continually improve in that area. So when you think about um, this piece of software, why why do you think portals? or a portal is such an important piece of the puzzle for advice businesses. Some businesses might go, oh, I don't need a portal. What I need is advice, better advice documents or I need better ways of, of you know, signing annual service agreements. Or, But you've gone portal is the missing piece in the puzzle. Why do you believe it's so important? What is it that, that, that's driving that? Well, por- portals are one of the missing pieces. Um, the others are also important. But, uh, so, the, I mean, there are a couple of areas or a couple of thoughts that come to mind. The one is, just the simplicity of the client engagement um, mm. opposed to some information going via text and some information going via email and others going via WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. Um, so the simplicity and of the engagement, um, the, the productivity and compliance efficiencies and improvement around there is a big one. And then the security is probably... One of the biggest is the the extra security that comes with with having a good quality portal as opposed to to emails. Yeah, it is frightening how because it, it can be quite easy to, to hack email, and if you've got clients sending everything in, I mean, I, I I imagine most of us on the webinar will have heard a story of a business who gets an email from a client and uh, they phone up the client to verify you know the request to send money to some offshore bank account, and it turns out the client knows nothing about it. And you look at that, and I've heard stories of people that you know they've actually followed it through, and and that that's that's a, that's a major issue, which 
we probably will never hear of outside of uh, business channels. But yeah, the security is a big one. So what kind of businesses do you find this solution works best for or portal works best for? Is there any kind of business that goes, yep, that's what I need? In particular, your version, which is you've deliberately made it simple. You're not trying to build data feeds with a thousand different platforms or create modeling tools or you know that, that, that can model what happens 60 years in the future. You've kept it really simple. Who do you think, who do you feel it's, it's best suited for? Okay, so I'm clearly not objective when I when I answer this question, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's it's relevant to everybody that's giving advice to anybody else. Yep. Anyone that's giving financial advice almost has an obligation to remove the noise and the complexity from the consumer, mm. uh, from the client. If if we do nothing else but we make finance less intimidating and simpler for for people, we've done a good job. Um, so, so I think it's relevant to all of those people. In the last few weeks, I've actually had a lot of meetings <laughs> with compliance officers. Yep. And just saying to them, what are the pain points of advisors when it comes to annual audits, when it comes to you guys as compliance officers, what are your pain points when it comes to having conversations? Um, and what I realized is that the, the engagement hub is actually solving for a lot of those things already. There were three or four areas that were quite interesting that came up that we weren't solving for, which I felt we could easily solve for. So we've we've actually fixed a couple of those um, those things. A good example being, um, as an advisor, we compelled to send an FSG out to to clients. From a compliance officer's point of view, they would just love to be able to easily see that that FSG has been sent and it's been read. So we've just built a little tool that says, yes. It's been given to the client, and yes, it has been read. Um, yep. Just some simple, simple little wins make a big difference to the advisors and the compliance officers. But hundred percent, like we, as you know, we've got a member site, and we can we can see when people are logging in. We can see whether they've clicked a link in an email or haven't clicked a link. We can see what they viewed. We can see what they haven't viewed. We can see how long they've viewed it. And similarly, if you've got a platform where um, you know you're sending out a link to a client, you can and you can track where they've logged in, where they've looked at it, you can set up a whole bunch of automations in the back of it, yep. um, which will do that as well as compliance records. But you just can't do that if your 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 plan to ma- to manage the, I don't know, the annual agreement, the FSG, is send it out and then get them to re- respond or, or or just guess whether or not they've got it. It's, yeah, it's it's it makes so much sense. Where's it at right now? Like, is it is it is it a point where it's being released? Is it something, you know, is it on general sale? Is there a website? where people can access it? So, yes to all of the above. We've tested, we've been beta testing for for quite a while now, for a good few months, um, both in South Africa and Australia. Um, It's working really, really efficiently, really well. I've been using it in my practice in the earliest form over 12 months ago, and I've been using it subsequent. I had... (laughs) seven or eight financial advisors that are coached on a journey for for six months um, over Zoom in South Africa, and they've been using it. Um, so we, we're ready. We, we're live. We've got our first few um, clients in Australia working with it right now. Um, I can't remember what uh, what the rest, second part of the it's, question was. It's... Um... It's always those first few clients you get. They're the ones that you kind of, I don't know. I got, when I, when I first launched the program, it was the first two or three clients I got traction with. I'm like, oh my God, it's got, you've got something and it's going. So how does it work in terms of cost and pricing? Like, is it something people have to sign up for a period of time? Does it take time to implement? Is it a monthly thing? Is it a, is it an annual fee? How does it work? So we've got two options. We've got a monthly fee and we've got an annual fee. You, um, there's a, there's a meaningful discount if you take an annual, uh, an annual fee. Okay. Um, there, there are a couple of variables that go into the pricing. The one is how many advisors and admin people within the practice, um, how many clients that you you're putting on board. Um, those are sort of the, the key variables. Um, we uh, the, probably the best the best part um, or, or the best next step if somebody's interested would be just to send me an email. Um, yep. Um, I can. Give you, I don't know if you've got the email address. So it's, so it's martin at engagementhub.net. 
Martin at Engagement Hub. You've got to get to com.com, dude. Uh, there's actually a, an accounting practice, believe it or not, in Perth. That yeah. Engagementhub.com.au. They got to com. Dot com uh, damn. All right. We'll see if you can get dot, uh, dot au because I know they're going to go sort of in no, for any day now, they're going to go out to anybody who doesn't buy the dot com dot au. Uh, anyone who has a dot com dot au, they'll, they'll, they'll eventually be given the opportunity to buy the dot a. And if they don't buy it, you could potentially get it. But so, um, and is there, is there a landing page if someone gets that wants to go in and get an understanding of the functionality or just email you and you'll give them the, the yeah, so, so both. So, so email me because I can probably give them a lot more information. And I've got yep. uh, a guy that's helping me roll this out to any planners. We, we're giving a lot of DLC at the moment. Okay. Trevor, Trevor Mervis, uh, is that is, name looks familiar. He's ready to follow up and he's ready to, to be in front of clients. Shout out Trev. How are you going? Um, and what's the website? So it's www.engagementhub.net. That makes sense. Yep. Cool. Exactly. So that, that'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, we can send more information. We can, we can communicate more. And as, um, as, as you, you asked me when you were in my office, uh, a couple of months ago that if I, if I did this sort of workshop and had a chat with you, would I would I be prepared to help your your advisors? And what I committed to you is, if people come on board by the end of January, we would we would give them a twenty five percent discount off their first year's um, subscription. Nice. And they to get that, they just um, email you. Martin so and so email Martin. us, and then Trevor or myself okay. will be in touch with them. We will we'll help them get up and running, and and we'll do we'll help them through that. Uh, Beautiful. Prospect. So, Martin, I want to ask you a couple more questions, and then I'm going to take uh, some questions from anybody who wants to who's got something they want to ask. Where do you see is taking Engagement Hub over the next couple of years? Where do you want? It, where do you? Where do you? Where do you? What do you want it to look like two to three years from now? So I guess what, like a really, really exciting discovery for me was the fact that I felt this is relevant to advisors, not in South Africa or Australia, but in the advisors. It's, it's country agnostic because it's not about tax. It's not about legislation. It's about um, improving engagement. So we want to try and roll this out in, in many countries. We want to influence many, many end clients and the way to influence those end clients is through influencing a lot of advisors to, to improve their businesses. So we, we want to roll out in 10 or 12 different countries around the world. Wow. Um, and starting here and starting in South Africa, that's the, that's the obvious starting point. Man, I'm on board. I'd love to, I'd, I'm, I'm like you, I'd love to take what I do and, and go to the US, the UK or South Africa. So if you get there first, I'll I'll, uh, I'll follow in your coattails, mate. Um, final thing I want to put out there, and and Andrew, Chris, Rodney, Sandeep, and Trevor, I really appreciate you guys sticking on. If there's anything you want to ask, please pop in the chat box now. I've got a question there. Or alternatively, if there's anything you've taken from today, I know that I have an above average need for feedback. Um, but yeah, let me know what's been useful or what you've taken from it, or what's been helpful, or what you've you've known, you've learned today that you didn't before. Um, and Trevor says, if you want to, yeah, Martin says, I'm happy to help and answer any queries. So please reach out. Where do you see the industry going? What do you think are the main trends that you look at the next 12 months and you go, that's going to be really relevant to advice businesses, whether, whether it's something in the tech space or it's not in the tech space. What's your prediction for, for the next few years? So, um, if you think where we came from, so you rewind the, the industry back maybe 20 years ago it in my view at all the industry belonged to the product providers and to some extent the financial advisors but it was really a product driven and a sales centric industry the control then somehow moved to the regulators mm. the regulators started dictating the direction of the industry and it became a much more commoditized industry a lot of advice was starting to look the same because statement of advices were forcing the same thing in my personal view now, it's going to move back to the clients. The control is going to move back to the clients and the clients are going to say, okay, you've now got a regulated industry. We want a good experience. 
Mm. So I think we are going to have to, as an industry, start recreating ourselves again and creating better experiences if we want to keep charging clients for those experiences. Fair enough. I agree with a lot of it. I think um, anytime there is a massive amount of uh, involvement in an industry, what is usually put in place by by lawmakers who don't understand the law, nuances of law, but don't necessarily understand the nuances of the way industries work, you end up with inefficiencies and issues that was you know unintended consequences. And I think I, I, I attended a presentation where Stephen Prendival talked about the the kind of advisors that have exited the industry and the data. The data just shows that. The vast majority of advisors who have left the industry are, are those who we probably would say un, weren't weren't keeping up the standards that that we needed. So, looking forward, if we can get some of the inefficiencies out of the way, we can focus on on the experience, and, and we know it, we're confident that we've got this strong foundation. I think the future is bright, but I, yeah, I think there's, a, there's it's a lot of opportunity ahead of us, mate. Um, Andrew's got a quick question for you. If that's all right. Uh, in, in, Andrew's interested in taking a look. However, he has a very well-developed X-Plan site. He does. Andrew's one of those people who actually knows to code, knows how to code in X-Plan. Helpful. Does it integrate with X-Plan? Can it be used with X-Plan? Ah, that old question. <laughs> yeah, so, so it might surprise you that I've heard that question once before. Yeah, there was a smile in there. <laughs> so the, the simple answer, yes, Andrew, is, is yes, it does. Um, we're actually looking at enhancing the integration over the next couple of well, um, but the simple answer is yes, it does. But integration means different things to different people. And yeah. the real issue is what does integration look like for you? So when we'll take it offline, we'll actually understand it. We also have a reasonably well-developed x site, by the way. Um, and in the early days, it wasn't integrating at all. So what we were doing is we were simply just downloading the documents and putting them into x -Plan. And it was taking us all of 10 minutes per month longer. So I'm not talking about 10 minutes a day. I'm not talking about hours a day. I'm talking about 10 minutes a day if it didn't do what we needed to do. But I know that that's a question that's being asked of us all the time. I know it's a question that's going to get asked more and more so we're looking at enhancing those no, knowing andrew i think it's probably a very there's some specific areas like it might be a question about whether or not uh you can trigger certain emails to go out or trigger certain can data be you know documents be uploaded to the platform or maybe it's to do with um you know data integration so i reckon andrew if you, i know knowing you you probably have some very specific questions so reach out to martin and, and he will give you the answer straight up chris no problem uh, he's going to be in contact with, with you, Martin. M Martin, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Just to recap, I've taken a lot from this. I mean, I always do sort of when, I, when, I, when I chat to you and I always learn a bit more. But for me, I think what was really interesting was in particular some of the journey about how you got it built. Ironic that, you know, you and I have been down similar routes, although I'd suggest probably you've been far more progressed and spent more money on, on, on your tech than you have. But um, yeah, incredibly, incredibly useful. And, and just to reiterate, if you want to reach out to Martin, drop him an email at martin at engagementhub.net. And uh, if you come on board before January, 25% off year one. Any final thoughts, Martin? No, thanks for thanks for the opportunity. Um, always good to to chat to you. As, you. as you know, and I've told you once or twice before, how yeah. um, you've, really, you've really, really had a big impact on the way that I've thought and the way I've done things over the last three or four years here. Um, and um, it's, it's been really great working with you. The feeling has been mutual. I mean, like as, as uh, at least two times that come to mind where you've sat down and you've almost said, can I give you some advice? And I've gone, yeah. And you just turn around and gone, you should be doing this or you should stop doing this or you should simplify this. And it's, um, I, I don't know whether it's because of a product of, of what you've been building or whether it's your exposure to coaching, but I think to be given that feedback from, as a coach by somebody who knows what you do and, and has been involved in it is incredibly powerful. So, so I appreciate that. Really, really do. Mate, um, I hope your next week ends up being easier than uh, it looks. Uh, and uh, no doubt, if I don't get to speak to you before Christmas, or maybe we'll catch up over the Christmas period, but have a great break and um, yeah. Have some good downtime. And to everybody else, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Enjoy the Christmas break. Uh, if you need anything uh, from me, please feel free to reach out. Other than that, I'll see everybody again in the new year. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. See you, Martin. Bye. Bye.